This week on the Green Left News Podcast, Australia is complicit in Israel's genocide in Gaza through the Pine Gap spy base, Optus's nationwide outage prompts calls for nationalisation of the phone network, and Socialist Alliance puts forward 10 solutions to the cost of living crisis. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist, and today I'm joined by Green Left contributor Anissa Bamji. Welcome. Hi, Isaac. Thanks for having me. And at least 10 million people were impacted by a nationwide blackout of Optus's phone network on November 8, unable to access messaging, internet, mobile data or phone calls for more than 12 hours. And phone services even went down at major hospitals and some Optus phones were unable to even contact triple zero emergency services. The train uh, network in Nam or Melbourne was impacted with severe delays and FPOS machines were out of action, many businesses forced to revert to cash only. And Optus CEO uh, Bayer Rosmarin blamed the outage on a technical network fault and has tried to smooth things over by offering 200 gigabytes of data to those affected. But according to RMIT communications academic Mark Gregory, an outage like this is bound to happen again because telecommunication companies like Optus and Telstra are prioritizing profits over maintaining infrastructure. There's a real case for renationalizing the communications network uh, to make sure that something like this does not happen again. Telecommunication services are no longer a luxury. They're embedded into our day-to-day lives and should be considered essential services. And with a transparent and democratically elected board, a renationalized network would prioritize better service and accessibility over profit. It would mean less signal black spots and outages. With almost 20% of people skipping meals to save money and the Reserve Bank of Australia raising interest rates even further, the Socialist Alliance has put forward 10 solutions to the cost of living crisis. The first is full and automatic indexation of wages and welfare payments to keep up with inflation, with welfare payments raised to a livable level. Second, the minimum wage should be raised to at least $25 an hour and full penalty rates restored. Third, private rents should be capped at September 2020 levels for 10 years and public and social housing should be set to no more than 20% of the renter's income. Fourth, a program to rapidly expand the supply of public housing is needed. Our fifth point is universal free health care needs to be restored, including free dental care. And meanwhile, private health insurance companies shouldn't be subsidised and the Medicare levy should be scrapped. Six. Uh, public education from early childhood to tertiary level should be free and the hex or help debts should be cancelled. Seventh point is free 24-hour childcare that should be provided by a levy on businesses and the gender pay gap should be eliminated. And eight, uh, make public transport comprehensive, free, frequent and free. Uh, point nine is scrap the GST and the stage three tax cuts and implement a steeply progressive tax system raising company tax to 49% and establishing super profits tax and wealth tax on the super rich. And the final point is replacing the RBA with a democratically controlled people's bank by nationalizing the banking sector. And according to Socialist Alliance, these measures could easily be funded by government with the will to break from the corporate profits first agenda of the major parties, as well as reversing the AUKUS nuclear submarine deal and other expensive arms acquisitions. In a surprising but welcome move, the High Court of Australia has found that indefinite detention is unlawful. While the full reasoning has yet to be revealed, the court is prepared to overturn the 2004 Al-Khateb ruling, which narrowly upheld the legality of Australia's mandatory indefinite detention regime in cases where a non-citizen has no right to a visa but cannot be removed from the country. As of July 31st, there were 1,079 people in immigration detention, with an average time in custody of 709 days. 127 of these individuals have been held for more than five years. This ruling provides an opportunity to create a fairer immigration system that respects human rights. On October 11, the federal court ruled that the government does not have to consider climate impacts when deciding whether to approve new fossil fuel projects. Less than a week later, 60 fires broke out in a 24-hour period in Queensland, 
and then two weeks and a thousand fires after that, Emergency Management Minister Murray Watt told the ABC that the number of fires and the scale of them is quite worrying for this time of year. The coming summer will be the first of the current El Nino climate pattern, which typically results in hotter global average temperatures, and the bushfire risk will be greater in this coming summer than the last two. Meanwhile, Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek has approved four new coal mines since May last year and more than 10 fossil fuel projects overall. And as climate change continues to accelerate, it's more important than ever to be part of the fight for climate justice. 100% Isaac, and this isn't lost on young people who are going on strike from their classrooms once again to fight for action on climate. The November 17th school strike for climate has not happened at the time of this recording, but when you're listening to this, students in major cities and towns across the country will have gone on strike. The strikes aim to hashtag shift the power away from climate destroying fossil fuel companies after a year of a record breaking temperatures and bushfire season looming. Yeah, the swell of grassroots action that these school strikes are a big part of do have an impact, putting governments on notice for their climate wrecking policies and giving courage to others to fight to protect the environment. And in the Northern Territory, the Central Australia, a Central Australian Frack Free Alliance, or CAFA, is suing the Territory Government over the decision to allow Texan company, gas company Tambaran to drill and frack 12 exploratory wells in the NT. CAFA is arguing that the Minister's approval was invalid because she failed to consider the environmental impacts of future gas projects. And a large community anti-fracking gathering was organised outside the Northern Territory Supreme Court when it began hearings on November 7. Previous polls have indicated that 86% of Territorians are opposed to fracking, and the 12 wells are just the beginning. At full production, the NT and federal government envisage 200 to 300 wells drilled each year over a period of 20 to 40 years. So good luck to CAFA activists fighting this terrible proposal. In more positive news, the Maritime Union of Australia, along with other unions and environment groups, is campaigning for an offshore wind farm in the Illawarra, near Wollongong. If approved, the plan would cover 1,461 square kilometres of ocean between 10 to 30 kilometres offshore from Wambara to Kayama. The MUA argues that it's an opportunity to build the renewable energy infrastructure we need to create thousands of good union jobs and meet our climate obligations at the same time. It's said that with a skilled workforce, great electricity, grid connections and port infrastructure, and a location close to large electricity loads and with strong and consistent winds, the initiative needs to be supported. Yeah, and another great initiative that's been launched is the New Coal Watch campaign. And the New Coal Watch campaign is tracking new coal projects in New South Wales. It's the initiative of the Lock the Gate Alliance and other climate activists. And Nick Clyde from Lock the Gate Alliance told 250 people at the November 9 campaign launch that there's a massive pipeline of coal projects in the works in New South Wales. He said the Chris Minns Labor government is following the previous coalition government in approving new fossil fuel projects. Meanwhile, New South Wales is in the top 5% of jurisdictions to suffer from the impacts of climate change, according to international research. You can find out more about that campaign at lockthegate.org.au. The biggest climate protest of the year is just around the corner. The People's Blockade of the world's biggest coal port is taking place from November 24th to 27th in Mullabimba, Newcastle. Organised by Rising Tide, thousands of climate activists from across the country are descending on the port, where a kayak blockade will block the entrance to Newcastle Port. There is heaps on over the weekend, including live music, performances, forums, training exercises, stand-up comedy, theatre and a full moon party. Not everyone has to get on a kayak or in the water. You are welcome to protest on the beach. Green Left is hosting a forum on workers' solidarity and a just transition on the Friday night of the blockade, and a bunch of us from Green Left will be there at the blockade, so come along and say hi if you see us. Uh, this is a climate protest that you don't want to miss, particularly if you're in Newcastle or Sydney. Make sure you come along. Just head to risingtide.org.au or click the link in the podcast description to find out more and register. We'll see you there. An article by Declassified Australia has found that federal labour and scores of Australian corporations are deeply complicit in Israel's genocidal attack on Gaza through intelligence feeds from the Pine Gap spy base and through military exports. 
This complicity goes hand in hand with their endorsement of the far-right Benjamin Netanyahu government's bloody war on Palestinians, in lockstep with the United States and its imperial allies. Investigative journalist Peter Cronau on November 3 revealed that the Pine Gap US surveillance base near Alice Springs is collecting an enormous range of communications and electronic intelligence from Gaza, and this data is being provided to the Israeli Defense Forces. Former U.S. National Security Agency employee David Rosenberg, who worked at Pine Gap for 18 years until 2008, told Cronau that it is monitoring the Gaza Strip and surrounding areas with all its resources and gathering intelligence assessed to be useful to Israel. This intelligence can then be used by the Israeli military to target its bombing campaigns, which have already flattened much of Gaza and killed more than 11,000 Palestinians between October 7 and November 13. Of these, two-thirds are women and children, according to the health ministry in Gaza, and hospitals, schools, homes and refugee camps have all been bombed by Israel. Independent journalist Anthony Lowenstein told Green Left that Israel claims to be pinpointing terrorists but a blind person can see that's an absolute lie. He said the Declassified Australia report shows that Australian officials at the highest level are deeply complicit and potentially exposed to war crimes trials in the future because the intelligence they are passing to the Israelis is being used to commit war crimes. Australia's complicity in Israel's genocidal war in Gaza makes the huge protests taking place here even more significant. More than 100,000 people marched for a ceasefire on the weekend of November 10th to 12th, calling on the government to stop supporting Israel. Free Palestine Melbourne estimated that 100,000 marched from the State Library to the Treasury Gardens in Naam, Melbourne, on November 12th, and about 60,000 marched in Hyde Park in Gardi, Sydney. Protests of thousands took place in other major cities, including Gunnawal, Canberra, on November 13th, where activists raised the Palestinian flag at Parliament House. Many families have joined the protests demanding Israel stop killing children. So far, more than 4,600 children have been killed in Gaza by Israel's genocidal bombing. Their names were listed on a large banner at the Nam rally. It is becoming clear that the Anthony Albanese Labour government is losing the battle for hearts and minds over Israel's war on Gaza. And it is vital that the movement continues to grow to force our government to end its support for genocide in Gaza. Yeah, more and more unions are joining the call for ceasefire in Gaza as the death toll rises. And these include Union Aid Abroad, AFIDA, the New South Wales Teachers Federation, the Rail, Tram and Bus Union, the National Tertiary Education Union, Australian Services Union, New South Wales and ACT, the Australian Education Union, Electrical Trades Union, Independent Education Union, Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, Unions Tasmania and the Australian Council of Trade Unions or the ACTU. The ACTU statement on October 22 said there must be an immediate de-escalation and ceasefire and the creation of humanitarian corridors to allow humanitarian aid into Palestine unimpeded. Civilians must be protected and civilian infrastructure such as hospitals must not be targeted. It called for an end to Israel's occupation of Palestine and for a just and sustainable peace, which includes an end to Israel's illegal settlements, Israel's withdrawal from all of Palestinian lands and dismantling of the separation wall. Unions have also been leading the charge against Israeli shipping container company Zim, forcing it to divert its routes by organising blockades of ports in Naam and Gadi. Trade Unions for Palestine has been organising the Boycott Sim campaign, which started with a blockade of trucks loading goods on November 10th at Port Melbourne and then 1,000 people protesting at Port Botany the next day, including some on jet skis. Sim has publicly declared its support for Israel's war. It ships exports weapons to Israel, including, allegedly, white phosphorus. Human Rights Watch has verified that Israel used white phosphorus in Lebanon and Gaza on October 10th and 11th. It has a significant incendiary effect and violates international humanitarian law, which prohibits putting civilians at unnecessary risk. The hashtag Block the Boat campaign is an international one, with dock workers in Genoa, Italy, protesting Zim the day before. Yeah, last episode we reported on the protests outside the Indo-Pacific Naval Expo in Gadi over November 4 to 6, where weapons companies were meeting with politicians to sell their latest killing machines including drones, missiles, and surveillance systems. Well, some of those activists who were protesting uh, were charged with unlawful assembly for holding banners and chanting, and the activists were facing severe bail conditions as well. 
At one protest where activists blocked a group of arms dealers boarding a dinner cruise, the arms dealers became aggressive and pushing and shoving and punching protesters. Activists described the New South Wales police's response to civil resistance as being out of control and a waste of policing resources. And legal observers New South Wales confirmed they are deeply concerned by the biased and intimidating policing of these gatherings and the charges that have followed. November 10th marked a seven-day vigil outside the office of Labor MP Luke Gosling's in Quas Arena. Residents are calling on him to take a stand and call for an immediate ceasefire in Palestine, but Gosling is refusing to meet with residents, privately labelling them disruptive and a security risk. 16-year-old Anna Fatima Samast said she was very disappointed that Gosling had refused to meet with them. She said, We're just peacefully protesting outside his office while there are people getting killed in Gaza, and I don't think that's acceptable. Gosling attended a $5,000 ahead dinner with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, where both ignored the large community presence on the sidewalk of the Palmerston restaurant, who were calling for a ceasefire. Yeah, and this has been the case for many communities across the country whose elected leaders are ignoring them. In Nam, a protest has been called by Mary Beck Socialist Councillor Sue Bolton to march to MP Peter Khalil's office on November 18 and demand that he call for a ceasefire. It's important that we keep up the pressure keep protesting, sending letters, emails and phone calls to politicians to force them to take a stand against Israel's genocide. It was great to see Green senators holding up ceasefire now signs in Parliament and walking out of the Senate in protest of Labour and the coalition's support for genocide. You can find details of upcoming Palestine rallies this weekend and beyond at the Green Left Activist Calendar, which is greenleft.org.au forward slash events, or click the link in the podcast description. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. More than 300,000 people demonstrated against Israel's genocidal onslaught against Gaza in the United States capital, Washington, D.C., and thousands more took action across the country on November 4. Protesters demanded that Israel cease its bombing and invasion of Gaza, which has killed more than 10,000 people, including 4,000 children. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken expressed 100% support for Israel, and the U.S. continues to send arms and funding. Significantly, the protest movement is being strongly supported by black activists and Jewish anti-Zionist groups, including Jewish Voice for Peace, which organized a 5,000-strong Jews Against Genocide protest in the National Mall in Washington. There's been a crackdown on pro-Palestine groups at university campuses, as young people are less inclined to back U.S. military support to Israel. The growing Palestine movement in the U.S. and around the world is already having an impact. In Canada, Palestinians and pro-Palestinian solidarity supporters are increasingly concerned about growing police repression in the form of surveillance and arrests of organisers and activists. Calgary Police Service Officers took the disturbing step on November 5th of arresting Palestinian solidarity protest organiser Wesam Khalid for chanting, From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Police are treating this basic statement of freedom as an offensive anti-Semitic phrase. There have been several other arrests at other events across the country. Police forces across Canada have connections with Israeli forces, including deployments through Operation Proteus to the West Bank. Police targeting of Palestine solidarity marches is not new, but has escalated as the pro-Palestine movement has grown in the past month. Direct actions to shut down war profiteers have also stepped up. Clearly, state forces that support, fund and arm Israel's occupation and assaults on Gaza are getting worried. And France has the uh, largest Jewish population in Europe, which is around half a million people. And prejudice against Jews is very real in France, uh, with far-right groups often making jokes about the Holocaust or even denying it. But now the far-right is claiming to oppose anti-Semitism and has joined a march with French President Emmanuel Macron in an attempt to cripple the pro-Palestine movement. Now, Macron first declared that anti-Zionism is one of the modern forms of anti-Semitism in 2019, and his government is determined to smear the Palestine Solidarity Campaign as anti-Jewish, despite the large numbers of Jews active within it. 
And there were attempts to ban pro-Palestine rallies in Paris, but huge numbers turned out to the protests. The left was under huge pressure to join uh, rallies against anti-Semitism that were being led by Macron and the far right. But the biggest radical left organization, France Insoumise, decided not to join the demonstration, saying fighting against anti-Semitism and all forms of racism is not possible if marching alongside a party whose origins are in collaboration with the Nazis. The General Confederation of Labour also rejected Macron's march. Students' access to university education in India is being threatened by the Narendra Modi regime's National Education Policy, or NEP, which was introduced by stealth during the pandemic lockdowns in 2020. The BJP government claims that NEP is an attempt to modernise higher education by building a global best education system rooted in Indian ethos and transforming India into a global knowledge superpower. But in reality, the NEP is a thinly veiled exercise in gutting the public university system and reinforcing Hindutva ideology. The All India Students Association's former president, N. Sai Balaji, said, The second term of the Modi government represents a complete destruction of public funded education. He said, NEP 2020 goes a further step in corporatizing education and in institutionalizing privatized education as the new normal. The NEP also alters parts of the syllabus to present a radically different view of history that centers Hindutva and the RSS. And you can read more about all of the stories that we've talked about today, as well as videos, details, analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. As we mentioned earlier in the podcast, the people's blockade of the world's biggest coal port in Mullumbimba, Newcastle, is coming up on November 24th to 27th. Click the link in the description to find out more. And on November 21, Green Left is holding a forum titled Building an Unstoppable Environment Movement, Protect the Right to Protest in Gadi or Sydney and online. Uh, And you can come along to that to hear from climate and civil rights activists about resisting anti-protest laws and building the climate movement. Speakers include journalist Paul Gregoire, Emma Dorge from Blockade Australia, and Zane Alcorn from Rising Tide. You can find out more info at the link in the description. And you can also find more upcoming protests, forums, and events at greenleft.org.au forward slash events, including all the upcoming Palestine rallies. So head to greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find out what is going on in your city. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. Your support is greatly appreciated. And thanks to Little Archer Beats for the music and editing. And remember to follow at Green Left online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.